Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Roger Mosey, the Master of Sewing. It's nice to see such a big crowd here tonight in the Quarry White House Auditorium, and even more people joining us online, so you are equally welcome too. Thank you for being there. And it's a special delight tonight to welcome our speaker, Shashi Tharoor, who is a former international civil servant, a diplomat, a politician, writer, and public intellectual, and one of the best-known figures in India. Now, he's here because he's written an excellent book about B.R. Ambedkar with the subtitle, The Man Who Gave Hope to India's Dispossessed. Now, I think it's fair to acknowledge um, straight away that many of you will heard, have heard a lot about Ambedkar as one of the great men of 20th century India and his incredible journey from what was described in those times as being one of the untouchables into one of the most highly educated and influential figures of his generation. And this being Cambridge, we have many distinguished experts in our audience tonight. But others may not have heard of him at all, which would certainly not be the case with other leaders such as Gandhi or Nehru. And quite a number of colleagues here at Selwyn were educated into Ambedkar's significance by this event happening and by the book. And that may be one of the themes we discuss, why this disparity. We may want to explore that tonight. And emphatically, as a non-expert myself, I'm going to leave the questioning mainly to our audience. Um, if you're online, you can email a question. I've put it to um, uh, Shashi, master at cell.cam.ac.uk. That's master at sel.cam.ac.uk. Or otherwise, we will test our throw microphone and bring in people here in the auditorium. And finally, for me, uh, there is a Selwyn connection with tonight's event. Uh, David Dabedine, an honorary fellow of the college, together with his colleague Dr. Roger von Svanenberg, who's director of the Pluto Educational Trust, uh, they are in, here tonight and they were involved in the commissioning of the Manchester University Press series entitled Global Icons, of which this book is the very first, Shashi tells me. And they're particularly interested in Dr. Ambedkar since the majority of Indians, more than two million, who were shipped in the 19th century as indentured labourers to the Caribbean, Fiji, South Africa, Mauritius and elsewhere, were Dalits and from the lowest castes. And Selwyn is happy to announce a five-year programme of visiting bi-fellowships in indentureship studies, which will start next week with the appointment of Professor Gyotra Bahadur. And these fellowships will, we believe, be the first such at any university worldwide. And we acknowledge the role the Amina Gafoor Institute has played in making those fellowships a reality. We thank Ramish and Leela Narain this year, and Tulsi Dayal and Claudette Singh next year for their additional support. But now let's get straight underway with tonight's event. And um, Shashi is going to speak for maybe 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes, about the book and why he wrote it. And then we're going to start asking questions, and uh, I'd appreciate it if you get your questions ready. So, uh, Dr. Thoreau. Thank you so much, Master. Am I audible, Claire? Thank you so much for those kind words of introduction. I just put online while you were talking on Twitter that people can follow this online but I didn't have a link to tweet oh, to we, them. We'll, we'll get so, it sent to you. <laughs> if somebody can do that, I might add the link to the tweet uh, later. However, uh, let me first of all add my word of thanks to Professor David Davidine, who's here, and who has been kind enough to uh, uh, be instrumental in, in getting this book off the ground and getting Manchester University Press to uh, commission it, and who, um, along with the Amina Gafur Institute, the Pluto Educational Trust, um, and of course, the gracious master of Selwyn College and his staff are responsible for me being here with all of you this afternoon. Well, the first question I'm often asked about this book, or the first questions I'm often asked about the book are why Ambedkar and why now? It is, of course, tempting to reply, read the book and find out, but I prefer to respond by informing my questioners of two facts of which even most Indians are unaware. First, that there is no Indian of whom more statues have been erected across the length and breadth of India than Ambedkar, barring perhaps Mahatma Gandhi. Second, when in 2012 two respected television channels conducted a poll to name the greatest Indian of all time, over 20 million voters participated and resoundingly, resoundingly picked Ambedkar 
ahead of everyone else, including the giants of contemporary Indian history that the master mentioned. So arguably, there, are, there is no more important figure in contemporary India after Mahatma Gandhi than Dr. Ambedkar. In addition to the ubiquitous statues and busts of him everywhere, there are also more observances of his life and legacy than anyone else's. His posthumous stature has grown enormously. A controversial figure in his own lifetime who lost more elections than he won and attracted both opprobrium and admiration in equal measure. Today, he is almost beyond criticism. All Indian political parties seek to lay claim to his legacy. Yet he's not as well known to general readers, particularly abroad, as he deserves to be. There's a vast amount of material, much of it generated by the man himself, whose copious output is estimated at some 17,500 odd pages. In fact, uh, he's probably the only famous figure who published books after he died, because when he died, slumped on his desk, having finished the last words of the book he was working on, the Buddha and his Dhamma, they found so many other manuscripts on his desk that four more books were published after, I mean, posthumously. Uh, that's how prolific he was. But a concise distillation of his life and messages are harder to find. And I thought a short accessible biography, particularly for the non-specialist reader, that summarizes all the events of his life and critically analyzes his impact on India and beyond, uh, seeks, therefore, uh, to fulfill an important gap. It's difficult today to imagine the scale of what Dr. Baba Sahib Bhimji Rao Ambedkar accomplished. To be born into a so-called untouchable family in 1891, and that too as the 14th and last child of a poor Dalit subedar, a sergeant, or in fact a sort of sub-sergeant, a non-commissioned officer in an army cantonment, would normally have guaranteed a life of neglect, poverty, discrimination and obscurity. His father, in any case, was on the verge of retirement. But not only did Ambedkar rise above the circumstances of his birth, but he achieved a level of success that would have been spectacular for a child of privilege. One of the first untouchables ever to enter an Indian college, he became a professor at the prestigious Sydenham College and a principal of no less an institution than Bombay's government law college, in those days considered the top law, co law, law college in the country. One of the earliest Indian students in the United States, he earned multiple doctorates from the Columbia University and the University of London, earning advanced qualifications in economics, politics, and law. He was admitted to the bar of the, at Gray's Inn. An heir to a millennia of discrimination, he was admitted to the bar, as I said, at Gray's Inn, became India's James Madison as a chair of the Constitution Drafting Committee of the Constituent Assembly. The descendant of illiterates, he wrote a remarkable number of books whose content and range testify to an eclectic mind and a sharp, if provocative, intellect. An insignificant in infant scrabbling in the dust of Mao, the small cantonment town in 1891, became the first law minister of Free India in 1947 in the most impressive cabinet ever assembled in New Delhi. When he died in 1956, aged only 65, Ambedkar had accumulated a set of distinctions few have matched. He had successfully challenged millennial discrimination against Dalits, the untouchables or the depressed classes as the British call them, instituted the world's oldest, largest, farthest reaching affirmative action program uh, for his people and entrenched it in the constitution, guaranteeing not only equality of opportunity but of outcomes, so their reserve seats and government jobs and universities and medical colleges and in parliament and state assemblies for people uh, of the scheduled castes and tribes, promoted liberal constitutionalism in a traditionally illiberal society, managed a balance between individual agency for India's citizens and collective affirmative action for its most marginalized communities, and articulated the most cogent and enduring case for the principles and practices of democracy in a country emerging from imperial rule. Only one distinction remained India's highest civil, civilian honor, the Bharat Ratna, and when this was finally awarded in 1990, the only question raised by commentators was why it had taken so long. Ambedkar's was therefore a monumental life, and his towering achievements were made despite suffering and enduring humiliations that might have been enough to crush the spirit of a lesser man 
or turn him into a destructive force. Denied permission to sit at a desk or chair like his other classmates at school and obliged to learn his lessons from a gunny sack on the floor near the door, which no one would touch because he was sitting on it, and, and once thrashed for daring to open a water tap at school when he was thirsty, since his touching the water tap was deemed polluting. Ambedkar still achieved academic excellence, winning scholarships for higher studies abroad, and earning multiple doctorates in an era where even upper caste men wrote BA failed after their names, to show they had got that far. <coughs> Returning to the service of the Maharaja, who had sponsored his studies abroad, he found no one in the city of Baroda willing to rent an abode to an untouchable, resorted to deception, was found out and thrown into the street. Sitting in a park at night with his papers and certificates strewn around him, he wept bitterly and quit the prestigious job that he had earned on merit rising from such humiliations to become the most consequential political and social reformer of a glittering generation of freedom fighters was Ambedkar's triumph. And yet many feel posterity is yet to get the measure of a man. History, wrote the novelist Arundhati Roy, has been unkind to Ambedkar. First it contained him, then it glorified him. It made him India's leader of the untouchables, the king of the ghetto. It has hidden away his writings, it has stripped away the radical intellect and the searing insolence, unquote. It is indeed largely true that whereas some of those who seek to stand on Ambedkar's shoulders today acknowledge his role in fighting discrimination against Dalits and others honor his constitution making, they do not engage with the totality of his political and economic vision. Ambedkar's concerns and doubts about Indian democracy and his leftist view of political economy and labor rights are usually conveniently overlooked by his professed admirers. They prefer instead to do exactly what he warned against, to worship him as an idol, an act of bhakti, rather than the critical engagement that he would have welcomed. Reviewing Ambedkar's colossal achievements requires us to neither restrict him to his role as the great emancipator of India's Dalits, nor to glorify him as a saint above criticism, but rather to embrace his life and his ideas as a whole, the activism and the politics, the triumphs and the failures that marked his extraordinary impact on India's public consciousness. My book, therefore, tries to offer a reinterpretation of his life and legacy. He died at 65. This book was written 65 years later, seeing his passing as, a, as an inflection point, a midpoint in the story of his life, because the legacy has outlived him and will continue to do so. Um, I do feel that it would be wrong to reduce the life of this extraordinary Indian to just one issue, his championship of the Dalit cause, just as much as it would be wrong to gloss over his part-making role in that monumental endeavor. So I would like you, if you are going to read my book, and certainly in the course of tonight's, tonight's discussion, to appreciate his contributions as a constitutionalist and a builder of democracy, in addition to his role as a social iconoclast and engage with his ideas and battles for the principles for which he stood. These include his fundamental critique of Hindu society and its practice of the caste system, or Varnashrama Dharma, whose annihilation he called for in terms that alarmed those who wanted to overcome untouchability without disturbing the existing social order. His conversion to Buddhism in the last year of his life, and his exhortation to others to follow his example. His emphasis on constitutional morality, as a means of sinking liberal roots into an illiberal society. His revival of the idea of fraternity, not merely in its French revolutionary sense, but as an authentic Indian idea, traceable to the Buddha and the early Buddhist Sanghas. And his astonishing intellectual fecundity in taking on issues as diverse as provincial taxation in British India, the challenges and advantages of dividing India into linguistically organized states, and the case for Pakistan. It also acknowledges his occasionally intemperate language, his ungraciousness to Mahatma Gandhi, whom he saw as his nemesis, and his unwillingness to suffer fools gladly or to make the concessions and compromises so necessary to get along in a largely hostile world. It's important to realize, by the way, in a university setting like Selwyn College, that Ambedkar was not only an economist of the highest quality, Amartya Sen, India's only Nobel Prize winning economist, was to hail him as the father of his own economics. 
and a legal scholar of rare distinction, but also a pioneering social anthropologist whose 1916 paper on caste at a conference in Colombia was arguably the first serious academic study <coughs> of the origins and practice of the caste system in India. Ambedkar was also modern India's first male feminist. His speeches and legislative interventions and initiatives on women's rights nearly 90 years ago to a century ago would be considered honestly radical uh, even today, um, at least progressive in, in a political leader even today in India. As a legal thinker, his emphasis on individual agency and his understanding of the true meaning of effective representation in a democracy are key to the constitutional system that has been established and entrenched over the last three quarters of a century. As a social reformer, Ambedkar's emphasis on education as the passport to social advancement and economic empowerment for subalterns continues to resonate in today's India. The very idea of Indianness, so brilliantly articulated by Jawaharlal Nehru and his acolytes, was infused with an extra dimension when viewed through Ambedkar's lens of social justice for those who have been oppressed and marginalized for millennia. Finally, in the tension between Mahatma Gandhi's vision of India and Ambedkar's, it is fair to say that it's the latter's vision that endures, codified in the Constitution of the Republic. And that vision is his finest legacy in the perennial tension between communitarian privileges and individual rights, Ambedkar stood squarely on the side of the individual. In the battle between timeless traditions and modern conceptions of social justice, Ambedkar tilted the scales decisively towards the latter. In the contestation between the wielders of power and the drafters of law, Ambedkar carved a triumphant place for enabling change through democracy and legislation. In a fractured and divided Hindu society, he gave the Dalits a sense of collective pride and individual self-respect and empowerment. In so doing, he transformed the lives of millions yet unborn, heaving an ancient civilization into the modern era through the force of his intellect and the power of his pen. The journey does continue, and this is not a comprehensive account of this, this rich and well-documented life, but I hope to have stimulated the curiosity of enough people who will read a short book and then perhaps be interested enough to delve into much more that awaits them in his own words and the more detailed biographies that unfortunately find fewer and fewer readers in the TikTok generation. Um, I do feel that Ambedkar's life and legacy are far too consequential for Indians and those interested in India not to be aware of, and I'm hoping that this book and our conversations about it will serve as a contribution to building that awareness. Thank you very much, and I look forward to our exchanges. So, Shashi, um, you know better than most that India is a vigorous democracy. Um, with, I mean, you are not a member, it's fair to say, of Prime Minister Modi's party. Um, how do you end up being a hero to everybody? Oh, I'm not sure I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was meaning, well, I was meaning a bed car. <laughs> I mean, it's you as well. I mean, it's fine. I'm happy. Oh, to you mean how does he end? Oh, well, of course. He, he's ended up being a hero to everybody because of a combination, I think, of social awareness that's changing and um, a certain political opportunism. It is simply not possible for any political party today to seem to be negative about or insulting about a man who's seen as an icon by 15 to 18% of the population to begin with, and to be seen as being on the right side of history by the bulk of the rest. And so even parties representing political tendencies that were critical of Ambedkar in his lifetime, or that, were, that he was critical of in, 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 in when they were originated in the Indian political space, even they have chosen to adopt uh, at least a lip service to his life and his ideals. So um, he's really beyond, beyond contestation. There are two statues uh, in, well, in front of the old parliament. The new parliament, uh, I haven't been, been yet to see it since my party boycotted its inauguration. But the two statues, the two people honored in front of the old parliament were Mahatma Gandhi and Ambedkar. These are the two now who are seen as being really beyond debate. And of course, growing up in an era of empire, and I, I, I was one of the people to whom the Ambedkar story came dismayingly as something 
relatively new to me. Mm -hmm. There was a degree to which he did work with the British more than some did because the key thing was emancipation. That's the right. key thing was social reform. So that, that's true. And, you know, it, it's important to understand that he has been attacked, for that he was attacked in his own lifetime, for not being associated with the Indian nationalist movement. Uh, he kept himself apart from it, and he was willing to accept office under the British, including the, the highest position in the country, the Viceroy's Executive Council, during World War II when the bulk of the nationalist opposition was in jail. And, and there were enough criticisms of it. In fact, there's a, uh, a fairly controversial book published as late as 1999 by a man who was then a minister in the BJP government called Worshipping False Gods, which was a 770-page attack on Ambedkar for having collaborated with the British. So you've got that strain of thought. But Ambedkar's reasoning was absolutely clear. He said, it's all very well to speak about fighting for freedom, but whose freedom? If you're going to fight for the freedom of the upper caste and the privileged caste in a in hierarchical society, then you're actually going to probably entrench the discrimination and suffering of my own people. So social emancipation first. Mahatma Gandhi's counter was we have to keep ourselves united in order to win freedom and not divide ourselves, which will undermine the cause of freedom. And once we've got freedom, we'll solve this problem. But that was where the two of them first disagreed, and there were other disagreements as well. So at this, on this issue, he, he was unabashed uh, about this. And it, it is to be said, however, to the credit of Mahatma Gandhi and the nationalists, that despite that, they extended an offer to him to join the first cabinet, even though he was not a member of the Congress party and had been associated uh, with positions of office under the British. Now, I'm going to bring in the audience in just a moment, but um, one of the things, obviously, your own stature as a politician is um, unquestioned, but one of the things you point to in the book, and you mentioned it in your talk just now, is that the cabinet at the start of India being an independent nation was amazing and had spectacular people in it. And, and you really draw a bit of a narrative about the decline in politics, which, of course, every country does. I mean, every mm -hmm. country thinks that politicians now are not as good as they were once upon a time. time. But, mm. but, but, but do you think there has been that decline? Is there, is there a, a sense that Baker's generation really had greatness, which it's hard to achieve now? Well, one good thing that has happened is increased democratization. That is that that first cabinet consisted of an elite. The constituent assembly from which it was largely drawn was itself elected by a very limited franchise. The British had grudgingly you know, granted us... Um, uh, limited franchise in the course of the first half of the 20th century, a little more doling out, a little more each time. But as late as 1946, the last elections the British ran in India, in a country then of 330 million people, only 30 million were eligible to vote. So we're talking about a very limited electorate. And so there was a perception that this was very much an elite, highly educated um, uh, establishment. But within that, there were people of tremendous talent and ability. What has happened since then is there's been a democratization of politics, and we've had people from much more humble and rustic and rural backgrounds coming up and rising to power and eminence. There's also been, and the two are not necessarily connected, there's also been a decline in quality. 33%, for example, uh, of our parliament has um, are people with criminal charges against them, and not just small things, I'm not petty larceny, but murder and coity and banditry and rape and so on. Uh, and, and, and the fact is that there are um, a number of people who perhaps are more representative of the, the overall sort of masses of India, but who would not have been able to hold, their, uh, you know, to hold their own and debate with any of the people in that cabinet. So that's the sort of difference that one does see uh, in terms of a decline in quality. But there is something to be said for the fact that in every country, <coughs> spreading <coughs> the um, principle of representation to all levels is extremely important. And, you know, uh, eventually that should result in an improvement in quality too. Okay, I'm trying to work out whether the figure of people facing convictions in Britain is higher or lower than 33%. <laughs> um, now, I, um, I'm afraid we, I would, it probably I would like to go to the audience to ask questions. Um, if you are watching at home, do email master at cell.cam.act.uk, and I'll put your question there. But we have this microphone over here which whizzes around the audience. You just have to be able to catch it. Um, Hassan, I can see that um, this is sort of almost the back row in the middle, very inconveniently. Yeah. Yeah, Hassan, Hassan, can you just wave your arm again so Georgia can see you? Right. Ready to cut. 
<laughs> yeah, we, we almost took out a member of the road. That's the thing. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> That's a great system. <laughs> okay, your, your question, okay. yes. Uh, should I stand up? Or is that... uh, no, no, don't, but just speak into the top of the box would be great. All right, is that? Okay, That's can great. you hear me yeah. okay? Uh, thanks very much for the amazing talk. It's always a great learning experience every time I uh, listen to your videos, and it's a great... Thank you. Um, Do tell yeah. me what you're studying, where you're from, and so on. Um, I'm Shaista. I'm from Gilgit, uh, Baltistan. Yes. And I'm doing a PhD um, studying brain development. Didn't you say hello to me at the JLF in London? Uh, no, oh, that's, no. <laughs> that's another Shaista. All right, sorry, good. It's a different person. So I met another Shaista from Gilgit in London two days ago, so that's very oh, interesting. Oh, wow, that's yeah. incredible. I... Small world. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this, 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 it's not um, a question, really. It's more just a thought, and I was curi curious to know what you think about it. Um, I was curious to know um, what you think about the role of class as a unifying force in the rights movements um, across communities in India, which have very strong uh, religious identities, you know. And I say this in the context of, for example, um, would a Muslim community be willing to vote for a working class Dalit leader compared to uh, an upper-class Muslim leader. And what do you think um, that says about uh, a shared an Indian identity? It's a fascinating question, excellent question. Thank you. Well, first of all, the issue came up um, in Ambedkar's lifetime, in his quarrel with the communists. He, 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 there was a lot he agreed on with Marxist uh, doctrines. For example, he believed in wanting to nationalize a lot of the economy, manufacturing, and so on. But he disagreed with the communists and their emphasis on class because he said class completely overlooked the social reality of caste. And, and so um, we had the extraordinary spectacle of the then Marxist leader, E.M.S. Nambudvipad, disparaging Ambedkar, saying, why is he distracting the nation on the trivial issue of Harijan rights? Harijan was the term then that Gandhi had come up for, uh, for the Dalits, uh, of Harijan rights when we've got far more important issues to fight for, uh, for the working class and for the freedom of our country. So that was a disagreement in their lifetime. But curiously enough, the labor movement and the communist parties in India did well for a while. In the 50s and 60s, they won seats in many places, precisely with people cutting across religious and other lines to vote on the basis of class. They were effective at unionizing workers beyond uh, issues of religion, for example, or caste, and in getting them to vote. What's interesting is that began to fade. There was a time when there were many parts of India in which the communists practically had a stranglehold on certain seats where there was a strong uh, unionized labor presence. Uh, all of those now have gone from their grasp. Um, and in fact, geographically, they now become essentially a regional party from my state of Kerala. Uh, they've been pretty much wiped out everywhere else in the country. Whereas religious-based and caste-based uh, political mobilization has only gained in strength since then. And what we're seeing now is that caste has become an instrument of getting people together. For example, the Dalit community has a very strong political party called the BSP, the Bahujan Samaj Party, which has made its leader, Mayawati, chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, our largest state, 200 million people, uh, three times. Uh, and that's because of leveraging the power of numbers um, into, 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 uh, uh, through the ballot box into actual office. Uh, whereas, as I say, the communists have been seeing a sort of secular electoral decline throughout. In principle, you could argue that there is this basis, but somehow the potency of that sort of appeal in, in, in the Indian political space has gone down over the years, whereas other kinds of appeal have gone up. I mean, there are a couple of parties, for example, of the Muslim community. They happen to be more regionally based, but they very strongly and overtly appeal to Muslim voters and Muslim interests. Um, one in Kerala, one in Hyderabad, and one in Assam, who, who are open about the fact that they, they seek to represent Muslim interests. Uh, there are even smaller fringe parties, but these three are, are fairly significant ones, and they've had people elected to parliament as well as to state assemblies. Um, you've got people, uh, the Sikhs, uh, uh, they don't all vote for the Akali Dal, but the Akali Dal is overtly a Sikh party. Uh, you've got uh, similar groupings, uh, not so effectively, perhaps, of others. What you don't have is an effective sort of purely working class party, or for that matter, even a purely upper class party. Just, there's no party that sort of just stands up for the elites uh, and the business community and the titans of industry as a party like the Swatantra Party did between 1959 and 73. That too has disappeared. So class interests as an organizing principle versus identitarian interests like, like caste and religion 
I think the balance and the seesaw are tilted very much towards the latter. Okay, okay more questions, Thanks, please. Um, I, uh, do you want to throw down to um, the end of the row there? Just wave your arm a bit. That'd be great. Oh, mm. oh two goes. Yes, please. Um, hi, Dr. Thru. Thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Sure. Um, would you hold I'm, it up slightly higher? Okay. There we go. Um, yes. I'm Shri. I'm doing an MPhil in development studies here, and I'm from the United States. You're from? The United States. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I was wondering, how has your own cast and experience with cast relations influenced your decision to write this book and how you approached writing this book? Well, you know, I, I was born uh, to, to nationalist parents. My father had dropped his caste surname in college. In school, he, he, he wore it with pride. I could see his school books with Tharoor Chandrasekhar and Nair, you know, TCS Nair written on some of his school books. But he dropped the Nair because Mahatma Gandhi had said that, you know, caste is not a good thing to... To, to preserve in independent India and so on. And, um, and he um, essentially never mentioned caste in the household. So, um, and, or religion for that matter. I mean, I, I went to school in Bombay where we had friends of every religion, every caste coming home to play. And never once did our parents ever mention, oh, that so and so, that Muslim boy, or that Hindu boy, or that Sikh boy, or whatever. It never came up. Um, the question didn't arise, and that was what that nationalist generation believed in that we had to rise above these distinctions that divided us and focus on our unity. The cliched slogan of my childhood was national integration, unity and diversity, that kind of thing. Uh, I only even became aware of my caste till much later. Uh, and, and then I had to ask my parents what caste was, what, what you know, Nair was, and so on. Uh, and that was a discovery. But I never let it influence my life. And nobody in my family uh, chose to consciously to sort of remain within caste boundaries when it came to uh, marrying or, 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 or anything else. I mean, all three of us, I have two sisters and I, um, married outside our caste. Um, and none of us are particularly concerned about caste when it comes to, you know, uh, in India I can afford to employ a cook. I don't ask him, you know, which community he's from. As long as he can cook well, I don't care. I mean, so I, I come from a certain caste that, uh, or a certain background, if you like, uh, of being oblivious to caste issues. Now, having said that, when I came back to India and to Indian politics, I learned very quickly the limitations of that. Number one, um, I wrote a piece uh, about this and was promptly rebuked by an 18-year-old Dalit blogger saying, don't you realize that obliviousness to caste is itself uh, uh, something only available to the privileged? and that I, as a Dalit, could never afford to be unaware of my caste. And that kind of shook me. I, I didn't, had not thought of it that way, and had certainly uh, woken up to that very seriously. And the, the second uh, uh, episode of this nature that I had was um, in, in my political uh, career as representative, as a member of parliament from Tiruvananthapuram. I had been similarly inclined in recruiting people to my office and so on. I just, just looked at their merits, their CV, the way they spoke at an interview and so on. I never, ever, ever inquired about their caste. And then I was accused of having stacked my office with people of a particular caste. And I had not even thought about it. So I quickly checked all their castes. And fortunately, the rebuke was wrong. One of them was from um, an underprivileged caste. But the fact still was that the majority weren't. And I then had to very consciously go out of my way. I mean, I had, in fact... Uh, a Muslim and a Christian on the staff. But the Hindus apparently were majority from one particular caste, and I had to quickly undo that. Uh, not undo that by firing anybody, but by simply re redressing the balance. <laughs> I wouldn't want people to be fired because of the accident of their birth either, especially if they're doing a good job. But I'm just saying, so these are learnings. Um, I think today in Indian politics, you have to be caste conscious. Parties give tickets to, to, to candidates. Um, with an eye on the caste composition of a particular constituency. Um, you know, such and such a place in Kerala, you really need a Christian candidate, or in such and such a place, you need a Muslim candidate, or a Dalit candidate, of course, is reserved seats. But then you've got, uh, even between a Nair candidate or an Uyrava candidate, there are, there are uh, questions of population numbers, uh, concentration of, of voters, and so on. And I never thought that way, and I'm learning that it's impossible. Even if you don't think that way, others who are important to your political life will think that way. So that's the answer. Uh, it's, 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 it's not a satisfactory answer because it shows that I came into this in some ways unprepared, but I have learned as I've spent time in this profession. I'm going to get the microphone to make shorter journeys, so can we go somewhere in the middle? Yes, a, a gentleman with a beard there. Um, 
There we go. Whoops. Whoa, oh, that was quite a throw. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope you don't play American football. <laughs> Those passes. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. My name is Kevin, a fellow Malayali. Hi. Um, uh, you wrote a book called Why I Am a Hindu. Right. And Ambedkar's views on the matter are fairly clear from Annihilation of Caste and also Riddles, of Hindu Riddles in Hinduism, I think, and other texts. So there is a point of difference between your view on the matter and his. Oh, yes. Could you, could you please expand on that? <laughs> well, Thank you. Well, I wrote Why I'm a Hindu uh, more as a response to the political uses of Hindutva as a political doctrine. Uh, to, to say that, in my view, it was a misrepresentation of what the faith I grew up with is all about. And so I talked about some of the basic philosophical ideas of Hinduism and the ethics of Hinduism as taught to all of us. Um, and certainly, uh, if you read enough and imbibed enough of Hinduism, you would not be a particular fan of the caste system either. Um, uh, there are episodes I cite, a famous anecdote that many know of the great Hindu sage Adi Shankara, Shankaracharya, the man who revived Hinduism around the 10th century, um, who was walking across a, a narrow bridge in Banaras in Varanasi uh, with his disciples when a chandala, that is a Dalit in today's language, was coming the other way. And the disciples brusquely ordered the Dalit to move aside for the great sage, and he stopped, and he refused to move. And he said to the sage, what do you want me to move, my body or my soul? Because don't we both have the same soul? And it is said that Adi Shankara prostrated himself at the feet of the Dalit and said, you have understood my teachings better than my own disciples have. I mean, that's the Hindu spirit, that ultimately all of us possess fragments of the same Atman, the same soul, that ultimately we have that in common with all living creatures, including even plants and trees and animals, and that ultimately the purpose, the search, the quest of the soul is to attain ultimately merger with the Brahman, the, the divine Godhead, the ultimate cosmic consciousness. That sort of idea does not really permit of distinctions based on birth and so on. But society and the social evolution of society is sometimes different from what the religion and the philosophy teaches. And that's where the challenge has arisen. Now, I don't disagree with Ambedkar on the need to reject the caste system. I personally have not practiced caste, as I explained in response to the earlier question, and therefore I don't see any particular merit in it. It may have made sense as a profession-based categorization uh, in more traditional rural society many, many years ago, centuries and decades, uh, centuries ago. But in today's modern world, it makes no sense at all. As Ambedkar rather brusquely pointed out, when, when Gandhiji said that Varna Sharma Dharma was part of the, the core uh, element of Hindu societies, in that case, why aren't you practicing the profession of the caste you were born into? Uh, he was born into a merchant caste, a Banya caste, and there he was doing politics. So, I mean, the point is that it, it, it ultimately did become somewhat uh, absurd as a, as a proposition to suggest that all the, the elements of the caste system were still applicable in the 20th century. And to that degree, I agree with Ambedkar. Where I disagree with him was both on his complete rejection of Hinduism as a whole, um, where he completely overlooked the existence of these liberal and inclusive trends in Hindu philosophy and thought, as well as the examples of teachers, preachers, reformers, uh, people of very many different faiths, uh, very many different castes who, who stood for the faith over the centuries. Um, and he, he gave them short shrift. And some of his comments were quite truly intemperate. I've quoted one in the book uh, in particular where he said, there might be a better or worse Hindu, but a good Hindu there cannot be. I mean, that kind of language um, I thought was needlessly intemperate because it overlooked so much that Hinduism did have to offer. And, and to that degree, I parted company with him. Uh, we're going to the second row here, third along. So can you just wave your arm? And, um, the the, the, the um, fawn... Oh, top, good catch. Brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. Spot on. <laughs> yes. um, hi, Dr. Tarur. Hi. I'm also a fellow Malayali. My name is Nazneen. I'm hi. from Calicut. Okay. Hi. Um, and I'm doing my MPhil in population health sciences, but my question is very Not unrelated about to that. <laughs> So um, I guess my question is also related to what Kevin said, like it was very interesting to read how critical Ambedkar was of Hinduism and the hierarchies within the religion. Um, but we have, th there's been a lot of globalization that's happened, Indians have moved to other parts of the world. So recently in the US they um, had the anti-caste bill in California. So. Um, 
I mean, I'm I, I, I'm trying to see like, would that happen in a state like India? Like, I mean, as it's a Muslim, already illegal. The Constitution outlaws untouchability. You cannot discriminate right, on that basis. But at the same time, as a as a Muslim woman myself, seeing the plight of my community now. Don't you think um, what, like his um, ask to annihilate caste um, is what maybe trickle down to this, like what's happening to other religions in the country? Yes, I've actually traced, and in a few pages, because the book is, is meant to be a brief book and a distillation of all these issues, I've actually traced the spreading of, uh, of Ambedkarite ideas and, and, and these ideas to foreign countries, and, and there's much, much happening. There's a similar attempt underway in Britain, uh, to outlaw caste discrimination. The Seattle Municipal Council has passed a law already, and they, are, they have the issue pending in California. And I think, purely on the face of it, uh, adding caste to the kinds of identity uh, disabilities, if you like, that uh, discrimination is based on, uh, I find nothing, nothing uh, to complain about in that, because the fact is that just as we say that people should not be discriminated against on the ground of race or the color of their skin or the language they speak or the uh, gender they belong to or the uh, sexual orientation they have or any of those factors, by the same logic, they should not be suffering discrimination because of the caste to which they were born. And as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong with that. The political controversy around this is really not, I think, about the principle of discrimination being bad. It is about the fact that people have tended to see the attempts to outlaw uh, caste discrimination as sort of the um, thin end of a larger anti-Indian, anti-Hindu wedge among sections of the diaspora. And that's why they've become, uh, they've objected to this so much politically. Uh, if you see the issue on its own merit, I think it's fine. I think, I think it's, it's nothing particularly problematic. I myself have introduced an anti-discrimination bill uh, as a private member's bill in Parliament, which hasn't gone anywhere, but the idea that it should be illegal to discriminate on any basis, including caste, is, I think, a completely unexceptionable idea. Okay, um, loads of hands. Uh, do you just want to go along to the gentleman in the blue shirt? Oh, oh, right, sorry, there were two blue shirts. We've got the microphone here. We'll come to you in a second. Do, do you want to go... Hello, Dr. Thiru. I'm Pallav. I'm a postdoc here in the Applied Maths Department. A little higher. Uh, Pallav, postdoc in math, Applied Maths Department. Okay. So the question I have is related to the changing landscape of politics mm -hmm. and how does uh, Ambedkarite movement keeps on finding or not finding its new meanings. Uh, a revolution which saw its peak during the Commandant Mission uh, or Commission has seen a uh, lot of governments being formed based on these ideas, core beliefs. But as we have sort of moved away from that era, uh, the steam of this movement seems to have sort of been lost. Uh, there, is, there are a lot of issues. Or, so the question I would ask is, how do you see this movement going forward? And uh, especially in the context of the uh, the changing landscape, the current political I landscape. think it's gaining in strength, Polak. I think there's no question that, that, that these ideas are spreading not just globally, as the earlier question asked, but also, I think, in terms of death. And as I said, because the fact is that they're now, they've now become politically uncontestable, it's going to be um, relatively, I think, likely that these ideas will spread and gain in traction rather than disappear. Uh, second... Um, Ambedkar, remember, was not a revolutionary. He was very much a reformer. He believed in the possibility of bringing about change through discussion, debate, and legislation. That was his spirit. In fact, he famously said in a speech that's known now as the Grammar of Anarchy speech of the Constituent Assembly, he said that it was all very well to have satyagras and dharnas and hartals and fasts and so on when we were fighting a foreign country. But now that we have found democracy and established it in our constitution, we have to eschew such habits, so otherwise this would be the Grammar of Anarchy in our country. So he was not interested in revolutionary change. And so there's some of the more extreme sort of Dalit movements that talked about trying to force change, he would not be sympathetic to. Whereas those who are trying to use the power of the ballot box to bring about change, those would have his approval, I believe. Now, I'm not su suggesting that he has triumphed. In fact, I have a, a couple of quotes in the book from Dalit scholars itemizing the areas of, of continuing oppression atrocities, violence, and other problems that Dalits are enduring in many parts of India. There's no doubt that things are better. Certainly in urban India, they're very much better. It's very difficult to discriminate against somebody if you don't know who you're rubbing shoulders with on the bus, or when you go to an office and you're taking orders from a Dalit boss. Uh, so those things, people are, are beginning to drop 
that consciousness. I mean, there's other ways in which caste preference is practiced, which doesn't quite ta is not necessarily tantamount to discrimination. The classic example being being endogamous marriage. It's a startlingly high percentage of young people that responded in a poll recently that they were still in favor of marrying within their own caste, for example. That's really astonishing. But that's not, that doesn't mean they will discriminate against a Dalit colleague at work or, or, or not play with a Dalit uh, teammate at cricket or whatever. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying. Uh, there's a difference now between the way in which caste has become a sort of social tool as opposed to caste being a tool of uh, discrimination in many urban settings, in most urban settings. But the practice still exists, it is still entrenched, it is being used for political mobilization, so the, the struggle will continue for a long time to come. Okay, we've only got just over <coughs> 10 minutes left, so I want to get the questions quite short and punchy, so, sir, and then we'll go on the end of that road. This question My answers will have to be shorter too, sir. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Session. This relates to two of the earlier questions, the whole question of the difference between Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, I, I presume I agree with you because I don't know what your views are in any detail, but I, I agree with you when it comes to tolerance and diversity um, of uh, traditional Hinduism. I think Toynbee made a point of it, which uh, I read before I was a teenager in the world in the West. Where he's, Short, short Looking, question, please. Yeah, so he's, he, he identifies this uh, diversity, inclusiveness, if you like, of Hinduism. But on the other hand, I think caste became a part of what became evolving Hindu society very early in its history. Yes. So when you talk about reformers, for example, in the 11th century, the Bhakti movement or other reform movements because of the challenges of Islam and later of Christianity and so on, the very idea of reform suggests that the other thing had become an integral part and a fundamental part of that society. You're totally right. In fact, Buddha himself started off as a reformer within Hinduism. And Buddha was, was attacking a Hinduism that was, in many ways, um, I don't know if you're hearing my... Yeah. So Buddha was, the Buddha himself was a reformer, was attacking a Hinduism that was in many ways ossified, entrenched, hierarchical, uh, excessively uh, ritualistic, and so on, and he succeeded as a result in, 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 in spreading a very different kind of message, a, a far more sort of uh, uh, middle-of-the-road way of life uh, that, that moved society away from temples and into uh, reflective monasteries and that sort of thing. Adi Shankara, Shankaracharya, was actually... Uh, fighting to revive Hinduism against Buddhism and Jainism, um, uh, rather than Islam, which had not taken hold at all in the country at that time. Um, but subsequently, yes, uh, when Islam came and made its advent in the subcontinent, you had the Bhakti movement, you had the emergence of Sikhism, which is an attempt to do. You also had uh, the syncretism of Sufism, which came out also from the merging uh, of Hindu traditions with, with Muslim ones. So you've had all of these things. And I, I think that if, you, if you look back at Ambedkar's sort of choice of Buddhism, that's, you know, it's his to make, uh, but he finds sort of um, justifications for it, um, and in some considerable detail in one of his books, um, in issues that mattered to him through his education and his thought as well, like, for example, fraternity, which I mentioned in my remarks, the principle of fraternity and brotherhood was what he felt was lacking in Hinduism because a Brahmin would not consider his Dalit uh, fellow Hindu to be uh, a fraternal figure, and that sort of thing. So he, he wanted to cite Buddhism to also make certain political points. Th that's the only, otherwise what you said is quite right. Okay, quick fire. Yes, sir. Uh, namaskar, Dr. Thru. Uh, thanks for talking to us today. And uh, I'm Hitesh. Uh, I'm doing AMPHIL in Engineering for Sustainable Development. And my question relates to what I'm doing currently. Uh, my dissertation focuses on telemedicine and uh, how it can influence uh, access to healthcare services. Sorry, which medicine did you say? Telemedicine, telehealth. Telemedicine. Yeah. Do, do raise it a little bit. Yeah, I'm losing sorry. some of your words. Yeah. So, and how uh, it can influence or improve uh, health access in remote areas mm -hmm. uh, in India. Sure. And, uh, uh, and part of my uh, my research question uh, uh, talks about the human connection and and uh, when when we talk about access access to people then uh, different uh, criteria comes in play or dynamics comes in play and and how do you see uh, that uh, 
technology, when, when we introduce some, any new technology, how, how society respond to that and what care we should take when, 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 we, when we are rolling something, something like this, uh, a new technology in the society, especially in the areas uh, which is uh, remote and, and don't have... Right. I, I think, yeah. number one, it's an ex extremely important thing. It's a good thing. It's necessary. It's positive. Already there have been anecdotes of lives being saved because people were able to consult doctors uh, by Zoom video conferencing calls and so on and get uh, hands-on advice literally while things were happening. Uh, I myself inaugurated a service in my state of Kerala, uh, which is uh, an electronically and internet-empowered em ambulance where literally the person can be put into an ambulance which is connected to the, uh, uh, to the, to the uh, specialists in the hospital. And the specialist can actually guide some basic first responder treatment, even while the ambulance is nego negotiating its way through traffic to get there. So that's, again, another way of, 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 of telemedicine. There are also, of course, the far more important <coughs> challenges of being able to teach doctors in remote areas by having access to operations being conducted in big cities and so on. Okay. All of this is essential. We are very much in favor. There's no political divide on this. And I think um, if you're working on this area, there's plenty of scope for growth and development of this right across. Okay, we're going to go to the end row there. And then to make the microphone throw very difficult, uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt, one row, one row from the okay, back. Right. But keep, it, keep it quick if you can. Yeah, okay, please. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. It's my name, Mr. Turanya. Uh, but your talk was excellent. Thank uh, you. Sir. And I must say, jab him because they related the Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, my question, but it's before that, then I would like to correct then. Dr. Ambedkar was a reformer, but he's revolutionary as well. If you read... Uh, what is well, sorry? Uh, revolutionary. He was Why? there definitely. Yeah, I can't provide because the 14th October 1956, when he converted in Buddhism, mm -hmm. it was really big revolutionary, mm -hmm. that things. And that's what we call the revolution. Anyway, so my question is uh, related to the politics. All politics in, uh, in India, they use the poster and name of the Dr. Ambedkar. Yes. But they don't follow his thinking or his thoughts. Quite or, right. But why is that? But probably you know them more than anybody else. So why is that? Because Sir. there's hypocrisy in politics, which is not news, I'm sure, <laughs> to you. But first of all, uh, when he converted to Buddhism, you'll be surprised. Uh, it didn't create shock waves or revolutionary waves in India. In fact, the biggest voice of the Hindutva movement, the man who made the concept popular, V.D. Savarkar, welcomed uh, Ambedkar's decision as having kept within the Indic fold that Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism are all Indic religions. Yeah. And as far as Savaka was concerned, they were all Hindus. So he was quite happy. The fear had been that he might go to Islam or Christianity. Yeah, but it's just, it's, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the one big difference between the Hinduism and Buddhism, of course, many Hinduism, they, accept, uh, they speak up the soul and they connect with the God. Okay. But it's Buddhism, they, is, uh, they believe in consciousness and they connect with the human Correct. rather than the God. Correct. I agree with you that there are fundamental differences of which that is one. Yeah. But I should Sorry. tell you that you're right about the hypocrisy yeah. because as recently as a few months ago, yeah. a, a minister in the Delhi government of the Ahmadni party was actually criticized and forced to resign for attending a ceremony on Ambedkar Jayanti where he repeated the same vows yes, that Ambedkar had expressed in 56. Yes, so if anything, the quality of our tolerance has gone down since then. Yeah. And today's Hindutva movement, unlike the time of Savarkar, yeah. today's Hindutva movement is far more intolerant of this kind of thing mm -hmm. than 65 years, 67 years ago. I'm feeling really bad about this because yeah. we've clearly thank gone you for very another much, hour, hour, hour or more. I'm, not, I'm, I'm responding to people looking most imploringly at me. So the gentleman with the glasses and the beard uh, towards the end of that row, yeah. Um, you, Black you, shirt? Sir, yeah, yeah. yeah keep yeah. going, get yeah, straight ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, perfect. And then we'll go to the gentleman in blue and then the gentleman in the pink of the back. And that's probably going to be it. But um, That's okay. Yeah. We, we can go a couple of minutes over. Um, okay. A very good evening to you, sir. Uh, a little I'm, closer to you. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, a very good evening to you, sir. My good name evening. is Vaishnav Mahajan. I'm a student of MPhil in nuclear engineering at Cambridge, and um, I come from New Delhi, India. 
So my question is, um, what's your uh, personal take uh, on the fact that, do you think that Dr. Ambedkar's ideas, what he envisioned for an independent India and what he worked so passionately for, do you think that you're following his teachings and to what extent we are? And what's the future of the caste system and what do you see as in the next 10 or 20 years? Will it stay permanently as it is um, going uh, forward the next 20 years? Or what uh, subtle changes we might get to see? Well, you know, counterfactual is always very difficult to argue and, and very difficult to predict the future. Uh, if you had asked someone like Nehru or Ambedkar in the 1950s, they would have said the caste system is bound to disappear. It's, it's an anachronism in today's world. And in fact, it got more entrenched and became something that more political parties began to use. Uh, will its toxic ill effects persist? I think perhaps not. I think the increasing consciousness within India, abroad, and so on, of the iniquities and the, the horrors that this kind of discrimination entails should uh, see its gradual extinction. There was a very interesting study done, a poll done, uh, which revealed, for me, the shocking news that 23% of Indians still practice untouchability. And then somebody else said, but my God, 77% don't think of the progress we've made. <laughs> so maybe 10 years from now, that 23% will be 10 or 13%. Another 10 years from now, it may be down to 3. And it'll be gone in 25. I don't know. I hope so. But the fact that there are pe people who still practice untouchability is a revelation to some of us who, who, who would never dream of doing so and who are appalled that it's still there. So in the long term, I think it will disappear. How long the long term will be depends on each successive generation. Yours has a good crack at changing things for the better as you take the slots that we are vacating. And I hope that you will uh, stand up for equality and fraternity and ensure that people are treated with honor and respect. Sir. Shashiji, Jai Ramji ki. My name is Sudesh. I teach uh, accounting at the Judge Business School. My question is simply that uh, in the context of Hinduism, should we even use the term caste? Because as I understand, and my understanding is limited, the word caste is not actually a word that originates from Hinduism. Well, that's true. It's a Portuguese word. Uh, we had two ideas in Hinduism, <laughs> Varna and Jati. And uh, the complication uh, is that Varna probably started off to some degree uh, that's one of the theories anyway, as a sort of apartheid system that, uh, that may have come when uh, some sets of races were mixing with other sets of races in the same temporal space and drew some distinctions. Varna doesn't relate to color. That's, that's precisely why I was saying it's like an apartheid system. But then it changed from that into a profession-based concept. And in fact, even the, uh, the Purusha Sukta verse, which describes how God created the perfect man and... and how the Brahmins came out of his head, his brain, and the Kshatriyas were his arms, and the Vaishyas were his legs and thighs, and the Sudras were his feet, and so on. And of course, the Dalits were completely out of, out of even that. All of that may have been a later interpolation, but it was still linked to what they did, not, not what they looked like. And then, ultimately, uh, Jatis fragmented into lots and lots of subjatis. So today, when you speak of what is somebody's Jati, uh, there may be 3,000 jatis of people who are collectively lumped together as, say, Dalits. And therefore, it becomes extremely difficult. <clears throat> the Portuguese word caste is as good a term as any to serve as an analytical tool to understand what we can simply describe as social stratification or discrimination. <coughs> I, but I, I agree. I, I, as a Hindu, I don't believe it's intrinsic to Hinduism, and it should not be seen as such. I, I think somebody missed the microphone as we went by you. So the, the, the lady with the microphone now, if you'd like to ask a question, and then go back three rows behind, that's going to have to be it, I'm afraid. But uh, if you'd you've like got the box, go ahead and speak. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead, absolutely. Um, I'll try to keep it short. Um, given the very intense and <coughs> legitimate issues Ambedkar had with Gandhi, do you think it's possible to appreciate both their legacies truly? What kind yeah. of work do you think needs to be done for that and like specifically I'm thinking about if you want to read The Annihilation of Caste, one of the most kind of mainstream books you'll get out there is Arundhati Roy's The Doctor and the Saint where like you have both of them discussed together, you can't find The Annihilation of Caste separately and just, yeah, mm. given the issues that Ambedkar had. With. No, I think it is possible to, to, to reconcile the two but see them each <coughs> in the context of their times and their beliefs. If you read my book, which is not a very long book to read, you will find I've gone into this in far more detail than we have time for now. Um, I would say that there are some things about what Gandhi stood for that I would agree with Ambedkar were either wrong or out of date already, of which, for example, his emphasis on, on, um, on sort of 
an idealized notion of the villages as sort of almost autonomous, self-sustaining republics within this larger unity of India um, was problematic because, of course, then no economies of scale would ever have been possible. Um, Ambedkar, on the other hand, believed strongly that villages were dens of iniquity and sinkholes of prejudice, and he wanted uh, the cities to be exalted and believed in industrialization and urbanization and so on. Now, he was right in the short term. He may well turn out to be wrong in the long term in the sense that the world has also started moving down from that, that emphasis. So I think inevitably urbanization is going to happen. Industrialization might well change with time. Um, on other issues, for example, the issue of fighting the British, there's nothing wrong with Gandhi's emphasis on, on, on keeping Indians united. And, and uh, there's also nothing wrong with Ambedkar saying, but what about the people who are suffering uh, in, in our society? Which one should come first? And you can entirely accept why each person had a different priority. Uh, but nonetheless, there's, there's a, a ground for disagreement. Where I think Gandhiji wins is that he was more gracious about Ambedkar than Ambedkar was about him, <laughs> even when they disagreed. Um, and I've quoted examples of this. I, I was very disappointed in uh, one of Ambedkar's last interviews to the BBC, which is actually Googleable on YouTube where he said the most appalling things about the Mahatma, you know, five years after the man had been assassinated, and I thought it was unnecessary. Uh, and, and, and he'd made the point in multiple books and speeches, everyone knew, knew about his disagreements. Uh, that graciousness that, you know, Gandhi, Gandhiji wrote to him saying, what can I do to bring you over to my side kind of thing. Uh, he, he was constantly showing respect and appreciation, saying, I'd like to win you over. Tell me where I have failed you. Um, whereas Ambedkar was much more rejecting and, and resentful. So there, I would say that that's the one area in which Gandhiji scores. But otherwise, on the merits of many of these arguments, Ambedkar was probably, probably capable of winning the debate in most of our, in, in, before an audience like this one. Okay, I'm now feeling I've betrayed some people with whom I made eye contact, but a 15-second question. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are. 15-second question and a 30-second answer. Because uh, we, we want to do some book signing and conversation as well. So, question, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tharoud. Uh, also, thank you for your patience in answering all these questions. My uh, pleasure. I'll, I'll try to make it as short as possible. I uh, even said to the master, I'd rather not even make a speech. I'd rather just answer <laughs> yeah, questions. It's yeah. more interesting that way. So, one of Ambedkar's greatest frustrations was his inability to get a consensus for the Hindu Code Bill. Uh, which he is resigned he, from the government. Yeah, he resigned that. because of that. Uh, do you think in the contemporary Indian political climate, something like enforcing the uniform civil code would now be possible, his dream? I think it's difficult. I mean, even Nehru said it was desirable but should not be imposed on people. And you've got to carry everyone along. And I think uh, even the BJP government, which has been flirting with this idea of floating trial balloons from time to time, has taken no concrete steps yet towards proposing uh, uh, a uniform civil code or identifying what elements would fit into it. And there's some criticism from the Hindutva right, saying, you know, what Hindu customs are you going to remove in a uniform civil code? And of course, the Muslim community sees this as a direct assault on Muslim personal law. So there are some real, real tensions and issues around this still. And I, I, if, if a government with a 303-seat majority in parliament is, is unwilling or, or is still reluctant to venture forth on this, even though it is an article of faith for them and written in their manifesto, then you can realize that the political temperature still doesn't seem to them uh, right enough or safe enough to do this. Um, it's, it's, it's slightly bizarre in a country, in so many countries in the West, where they all have uniform civil codes, and they must be wondering, why can't you in India? Well, let's thank the British, first of all, for having given us all these blessed personal laws for, to, for different communities. When people have entrenched rights, Getting them to give them up are far more difficult than if you're starting from scratch, as many of these societies were. Okay, we, we are going to have to end there in the interests of books and private conversation. Um, Shashi Thiru, you, uh, this has been an amazing event, and I'm just so grateful to you for giving us your time and coming to Selwyn. I'm very touched and, that you invited me, thank well, you. Well, I, I mean, we're very honoured to have you here, given your uh, amazing record in public life. The, the book I can really highly recommend, because I say I started on a journey by reading it, and, and I can highly recommend it. Um, Ambedkar clearly is somebody that a lot of people will want to know more about, or those of you who are experts will, um, I hope, be consolidated in that knowledge by your very interesting answers tonight. There will be a lecture specifically on indentureship we aim to do uh, before the summer break, um, but otherwise, thank you for a brilliant audience tonight. You've been amazing. Um, apologies to the people I didn't get questions 
um, put to, and you can now upbraid me afterwards. And also people online. Uh, we got a lot of questions online, but I thought we should concentrate on the audience here. So thank you very much indeed. Shashi, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.